in some ways, um, again, I want to remind you of this idea that race is socially constructed, but it's also legally constructed. Right? It's constructed in law. It's constructed when people with power use that power uh, for certain purposes. So this whole transition from indentured servitude to slavery may not have been planned out ahead of time, but it does become um, the goal for those that are in charge, particularly in Virginia. Um, so white indentured labor becomes unsatisfactory for any number of reasons. Uh, and Africans are going to become uh, more prized as the laborers. And we've talked about some of the reasons why this might have happened, um, especially as people start living longer. It may have made financial sense then to try to enslave somebody for life as opposed to just four to seven years and then have to give them property and land and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we talked about how white indentured servants are becoming a problem in the society, revolting, running away, doing various things. Um, in a way that, that was easier for them than it's going to be for these Africans. Um, so there may be any number of reasons why that's the case. And we do know that it does become the case. People are going to start to favor black slaves, um, African slaves, and uh, try to deal with them. And this develops this whole slave trade, which we spent a lot of time talking about uh, and dealing with. It's a whole process, a whole institution uh, that connects the old and the new worlds, you know, from Europe to Africa, to the New World, uh, and back, continually back and forth. So it really is a, a global connection in a lot of different ways. Don't need to necessarily go through all of this, and you're going to have it at your disposal in terms of how slaves are acquired, um, how Africans fit into the slave trade on multiple levels. But I wanted you to debate debate um, who's to blame right, for the slave trade, and particularly to think about the role of uh, Africans as middlemen right, um, to deal with that questionable phrase, Africans sold their brothers, right? We want to complicate that um, using things like imagined community, things like um, tipping point, right, at one point to think about how complicated that is. Also to think about race, right? Th those Africans were looking at race differently. They were not looking at themselves as Africans when they start doing what they're doing. Not to justify it, but to, to at least try to understand it in some way. Um, now the chapters go into a number of um, things about these castles that are established on the coast, particularly as Europeans become more and more powerful and ultimately are more able to um, control the trade. Uh, ultimately, they are able to maybe make some of these um, Africans do what they wanted. But early on, uh, it really is um, sort of equal. Folks decide to become involved in the slave trade early on. Maybe later it becomes too late. Uh, but early on, it was a choice, you could argue, uh, at least. We talked about the Middle Passage and the trauma of capture. I wanted you to think about that with the whole Middle Passage exercise. Um, I told you I'll never teach you about slavery without teaching you about resistance, how folks are going to resist at every level. Uh, they're going to try to resist capture. They're going to try to resist on the ship. They're going to try to resist once they get to their new world destination. They're going to revolt. I will continue to talk about various forms of resistance, which was always present. Right? Res resistance was always present from the moment of capture through the Middle Passage and into the New World. Um, we talked about a bit about the numbers involved here, the massive amounts of people that are going to be impacted by this trade. If 12 and a half million slaves are transported and actually arrive in the New World, you can imagine how many more than that would die in the process, right? die in the process of being captured or die on the ship or die before they actually um, you know, are able to be seasoned and made into sort of productive slaves. So you can imagine the impact of this. Um, a lot of these chapters are, are comparative in nature. Um, we obviously are most interested in slavery and what becomes the U.S. because you know, ultimately uh, this is, of course, in African-American history, uh, specifically looking at the U.S. But part of how we understand the similarities and differences here is by comparing it to other places. What does slavery look like in South America? What does it look like in the Caribbean? What does it look like in Europe? What did it look like on the African continent itself? Right? So we have made some reference and read about some of the differences there. Sometimes it mattered, it were actually it always mattered what European colonial power you were enslaved by. So were you enslaved by the Spanish or the French or the Dutch? Right? Um, it, it determined your experience. It, it might make things quite different for you, whether you were in the Caribbean or in Virginia uh, or, or other places. So a lot of these, um, especially chapter two, is more comparative in nature, looking at differences in different um, institutions in different places. This is not to say that slavery was better one place. Like slaves weren't 
kicking it you know, at one place and, and had to work really hard in other places. That's not the point. The point is that you can see some of the similarities and differences. Um, and slaves do become afraid to be sold to the Caribbean or sold further south. Right? If you heard the phrase, um, sold down the river, uh, that comes from this idea that slavery was worse in the deep south or worse in, worst in the Caribbean. Um, and slaves will be threatened. Okay, if you resist, we're going to sell you south. We're going to sell you the Caribbean. Right? Part of that was a fear of, of going away. Part of it was a fear of being sold away from family uh, and whatnot. So there are going to be some differences, uh, but it's not as easy as saying that you know, slavery in the U.S. was easy or, or good. It wasn't, obviously. Um, most go to the Caribbean and to South America, as we'll see. Many more than ultimately will come to the U.S., uh, in part because the Spanish colonies there are so dominant and the Spanish themselves are dominant early on. Um, England is consistently trying to get their seat at the table. Uh, early on, they can't defeat the Spanish enough to uh, get, get colonies in the New World and, and gain a foothold. Ultimately, they do. Ultimately, it's going to tip, and uh, the British will become able to uh, kind of step in and, and um, increase their power, right? They would break the, the monopoly of the Spanish trade and ultimately get permission to trade, and ultimately they become some of the largest uh, slaveholders, but that's later. Right? Early on, the Spanish are the most uh, dominant. And, and this makes the Caribbean form of slavery look different than what we're going to see on the mainland. How is Caribbean slavery different? Well, there are a number of ways here. Um, absentee landlordism. Right? What that basically meant was, in the Caribbean, most plantation owners decide not to live there. They may have large plantations there, but they would hire an overseer. And they would go on back to Spain or Europe. Uh, they would go on back to their nations. The Caribbean was considered particularly unhealthy, particularly dangerous, right? If you have you and your family and you got 500 slaves and nobody else is around, <laughs> that's a dangerous situation, right? What if they uh, revolt? You're going to be in trouble. So it really was a dangerous, difficult situation. Uh, the disease context was high. Um, and a lot of folks chose not to live there. They would just hire someone to run their plantations for them. This could mean worse treatment, right? If you were the owner of the slaves, but you hire somebody else that doesn't own them, they might beat them literally to death or work them literally to death, especially if it's all about the bottom line of making money. Uh, they might literally work them to death, and often this happens in the Caribbean, maybe in part because of absentee landlordism. Overseers were hired based on how much profit they produced. And if they didn't produce profit at the end of the year, they would get fired. So their only motivation was to produce as much as possible. They didn't care if you were tired or sick or pregnant. Right? It was all about the profit line. And so these, these overseers are known as being particularly violent, brutal, uh, uncaring, um, and would take advantage of folks. The mortality rate for recent arrivals in the Caribbean was very high. They're getting used to these new disease contexts. They're getting used to new climates and labor forms and things. This was seen as a part of the seasoning process. Right? Those ones that live were seen as stronger, essentially. Um, yet many, many are going to die. Right? Food is insufficient. You're working you know, these long hours. You're not eating properly. This is going to lead to health problems. Slave codes, especially since, like you just mentioned, these Africans outnumbered whites in the Caribbean. You had some really rigid slave codes in places to try to keep them controlled, uh, to try to keep them from um, feeling like they could revolt and you know, kill everybody on the plantation. Right? It was a very dangerous situation for slave owners in some ways. Um, again, these slave codes were designed to control the movement and the freedom of the slaves. Does that mean that there was no resistance in the Caribbean? No. There always was resistance, despite these codes, despite brutal overseers, despite everything, we actually see quite a bit of uh, resistance in the Caribbean. In some ways, uh, there, in many ways, there are more outright rebellions in the Caribbean than there will be on the U.S., and there may be some reasons why that's the case. There were more revolts, uh, more forms of outright resistance than there was in the U.S. Now, some folks say that means that U.S. slaves didn't resist, right? that they didn't resist as much, and others have said, well, that means the slavery here wasn't so bad. Some historians used to make that argument back in the day, and that's not true. Um, what it means is that it was a different circumstance. Maybe it's easier to revolt if you're on a plantation with 400 other people 
65, and only 10 whites. That might be easier to, to revolt than it might be on a Virginia plantation with two other slaves and 100 whites. I just It's not the same situation. It's not the same circumstance. But we do see more outright rebellion in the Caribbean. Forms of punishment, again, we've seen all this. Um, and it's, it's the use of violence to sort of break these slaves. Um, just talking about some of these revolts. Almost every island, every Caribbean island, has a record of serious revolt. Some of them, um, long-term revolts. And even we could define them as successful. You ever heard this phrase, maroons? Um, maroon society um, were societies of runaway slaves that had resisted and set up their own society. They actually run away to swamps or mountains and would join with other slaves and literally set up their own little community. They don't go back. Some of them get so large and so strong that they're able to keep their former, former owners from recapturing them. Really interesting how this is going to be possible, especially in some parts of the Caribbean. So these Maroons, Jamaican slaves that revolted and ran away and formed their own communities in the interior mountain sections. So they try to find a place where it's hard to get them. Some of these could be as large as 10,000 people. 10,000 people. Uh, these are massive communities. Imagine communities if you want to use that. Right? They're going to set up their own society that doesn't have slavery. They would fight guerrilla style wars against the British, sometimes for years. Uh, the British, the Dutch would send armies to try to reconquer these areas. And some of them were so powerful that they were able to hold off those armies. Uh, Tacky's Rebellion, though, is, is, is no match for uh, these British forces, but there were other communities, including uh, Paul Morris, uh, which is mentioned, uh, that actually holds off Europeans for, for decades, in fact. Talk about seasoning, right? Making someone into a slave is, was a part of the seasoning process that happened, particularly in the Caribbean. Right? Considered seasoned after learning how to work, right? learning language, adjusting to climate, right? making sure you, you could survive. Uh, adjusting to this new food. Seasoned slaves might be then resold or re-exported to other places. So in Virginia, they preferred to buy slaves that had been in the Caribbean for a couple of years. They kind of consider them to be broken in and safer and more effective, more valuable in a sense. Right, so this notion of seasoning that we mentioned before. <clears throat> in Latin America, there was, there was slavery in Mexico. Again, the Spanish used them, in, especially in mining and other things in Mexico or Central America. Much smaller populations there, but they were there. And this is why, to this day, you see folks with African features in many nations in Latin America, um, especially in certain parts. If you go to Veracruz, Mexico, for example, to this day, uh, you still notice people in Veracruz are very, very dark skinned because a whole bunch of slaves were dropped there, especially in the kind of silver mines and things in Veracruz, Mexico. I have some buddies that go down there now, and like, you still see it to this day. You know, several hundred years later, this is how strong the importation of Africans was. South America, right? um, largest concentration of blacks in continental Sp Spanish America was in these, these places, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, um, and uh, places like Brazil, for example, uh, actually received the most um, Africans of any place in terms of the, of the New World. So Peru is one place, Uruguay, Argentina, these are all um, drop-off points, but none of them is as big as Brazil in terms of its importation. Introduction of sugar into Brazil would stimulate this need for labor, just like tobacco does here, but even more so sugar. Sugar is even more labor-intensive than tobacco is. So they just kept importing people uh, by the thousands and ultimately by the millions. Between five and six million of those 12 and a half million are brought to Brazil. So Brazil, again, receives the largest percentage of all slaves brought to the New World. Um, and this is, again, why Brazil to this day is very complicated in terms of its racial situation and skin color and everything else. Um, it has to do with its particular history. Again, I mentioned Paul Morris earlier. right? Think about this question of resistance. Um, why people resist? Of course, because they're resisting slavery. But how they're able to resist might depend on a number of different factors, like how many people are on your plantation with you? The Republic of Palmares was created by insurgent slaves. It existed for 67 years. These runaway slaves set up their own society that people could not conquer despite sending armies against them. Uh, they last for 67 years before they're finally um, 
overcome. Right? They cre created a community with institutions based on West African models. Right? Institutions based on West African models. So they were able to maintain African culture, um, certain language ideas or food, uh, religious practices and other things that they remembered from uh, the old country and, and brought with them and reset set up in places like this, uh, which was more possible when you're surrounded by 10,000 um, African peoples. The Catholic Church impacted slavery, uh, perhaps in both good and bad ways. So this is another reason why Spanish slavery looked different than British slavery. Uh, the Catholic Church um, impacted uh, the way it might look here, or tried to impact it in certain ways. For example, slaves could be baptized. Right? They would be married in the church. Right? Slave marriages in British North America are not legally recognized at all. Uh, there's no law forbidding them to read. There were laws forbidding them to read in the British colonies. Right? Slaves are not permitted to work on Sundays and feast days according to the rules. Now, sometimes these rules are going to be broken by owners, but at least they were in place. Right, so some people say this may be mediated um, slavery in these Spanish colonies and might make it less harsh, at least on paper. Uh, whether your uh, plantation owner actually followed this might be something else. There was more interracial marriage in the Spanish colonies. Um, there were fewer choices for uh, white men, so they had obviously to, uh, as we know, men are going to do what they do. Uh, they're going to find partners, just like we saw in Virginia uh, with those laws there. Um, they're going to find things to do, and that includes um, connecting across the color line, um, even if it's seen as not the thing to do. We know that people are going to get together and do what they do. Right, so I think um, that background is particularly important, especially thinking about the differences uh, between the Spanish and the Portuguese, and then what we end up spending most of our time talking about the development of, of slavery in North America, uh, and in particular, the British um, role in that, right? how different in some ways they, their form is going to look in other forms. Um, chapter 2 is good, still comparative. You notice they talk about Virginia, which we spent a lot, a lot of time talking about, but they also talk about New York right? and how different things might be there um, than they were in further south in Virginia. Um, there are Spanish colonies here, right? Spanish Florida, for example. <clears throat> so there still is uh, a presence of various European powers, um, and you, it, it varied. Your ex experience with slavery still varied depending on who was in charge of the colony. Did you live in a Dutch colony? Did you live in a French colony, a Spanish colony, a British colony? Your experience might be quite different based on all of those things, north, south, east, west. Right? Um, north American slavery emerged as European struggle for colonies trade and key ports. It's about money. It's about economics. Right? Obviously, the racial issues come into this, but first and foremost, they're trying to make money, and everything was really sort of geared towards that. Creoles, that's one of your terms, I believe, right? Creole is a, a word used to mean a lot of different things. Uh, in this case, it referred to people born in the New World. So if we're thinking about, quote, unquote, African Americans, right? Eventually, there are going to be generations that are born not in Africa and brought here, but are actually born here in the New World. How, how do you think a Creole African might be different than an African born in the Old World, or what they might call a saltwater African? How do you think they might be different? Say you're born in Virginia in 1650 versus being born in, I mean, on the African continent in 1620 and brought here. They might be enslaved together. How do you think they might be different? Any guesses, any ideas? about how being Creole might be different. Language, right? It might, it might pick up the English language more quickly, more readily. It might be the only language they know. Right? They may have already you know, not been taught their own language. So yeah, language, again, not even saying this is good or bad, but it's definitely different. Right? And you think about an African-American identity, it might make it easier to learn how to work as well. Right? It might make your transition easier. Okay. So they would have avoided that traumatic middle passage. Um, that's an interesting one, right? Because maybe they're obviously still going to be slaves, so they're experiencing some of the daily trauma, but that was a big one, right? That middle passage, when we talked about the psychology of that, um, that was serious, right? That was a, a very impactful uh, kind of thing. How might that impact something like resistance in 
because there were theories about this, that perhaps there was differences around resistance between those born in the old world and those born in the new world. What do you think people might have guessed or might have thought about these new Creole Africans and their ability or willingness to resist? They didn't fight too much. They, they didn't want the freedom that the Africans who probably came here. That was, that was at least the idea, right? This idea that, again, if you're stolen from your home, you got this idea like, I'm getting back home. <laughs> but if you were born here, you still might say, I'm not trying to be a slave, but you, you don't have at least that direct connection, like if I can just get away from here and get home, right? I know where I kind of came from. Maybe that does start to minimize your level of resistance. That's one of the reasons why they might prefer these seasoned slaves that had already been sort of, quote unquote, broken in, right? Um, again, we're gonna have, Creole Africans that do resist, right? um, and ultimately most folks are going to be born in the New World as opposed to being born in Africa, especially when you get to 1700s and 1800s. But it is interesting, at least that's the idea that they might be less rebellious, that they might be perhaps easier, more easily controlled. On some ways though, it could go the other way too, like if say they did speak English and some even learn how to write and read, although it's going to be illegal, that might make it easier to run away, right? you write your own pass. <laughs> say, for example, and, and take off, oh yeah, I got a pass, right, I'm out. Whereas if, you know, you're from the continent and didn't speak English yet, it would be very hard to do that. You'd be spotted right away. They're like, this dude don't even speak English. He's obviously somebody's slave. So it's interesting how that identity um, could have some really significant impacts on both sides of it. On both sides. There are some that would not want saltwater Africans for that reason, those born in the old world. And some might go the other direction, so. Early Virginia, right, we spent a lot of time talking about early Virginia and in particular white indentured servants, right, this transition from servitude to slavery. I said 75 to eight, 70 to 85 percent of whites arriving in the 1600s or in the 17th century were indentured servants. They were not free laborers. Right, so this idea of unfree labor was here from the beginning. It wasn't just Africans, but at least the idea, right, that people were unfree, that people should work for you was a kind of natural idea for, for folks living here. And it was difficult, right, to distinguish between slaves and servants early on, as we've seen. Ultimately, though, that's gonna change. Right? We've seen that in those um, rules and laws. New Netherland, right? New Netherland was a Dutch colony that is ultimately taken by the British. Right? It's taken over by the British after they would conquer uh, New Amsterdam, now Manhattan, in New York. Right, and they rename it New York. So it was New Netherland, it becomes New York, and it's part of the British colonies. And the chapter two talks a lot about how slavery there might look a little different than it looked in Virginia. Things like half freedom, right, which is one of your terms. Right, access to freedom is seen as more available. Um, under the Dutch, right, the Dutch India Company uh, owned the colony and all the slaves belonged to the company, not really to individuals, so some thought this made it easier to try to carve out spaces of freedom and even um, sue for your freedom right, among the Dutch. So there are more free blacks in New York than you're going to see early on in Virginia. Uh, there's not a fixed status of racial slavery there. This idea of half freedom where you could buy your freedom but your children couldn't. Right? So it, in some ways that's a contradictory term. How can you be half free? Right? Well, the idea here is that you can at least buy your freedom and in uh, New York in a way that you weren't really able to in Virginia, but you couldn't buy your children out. So they were still enslaved. So it's still a level of unfreedom. I definitely would say that, but it's different than you might see later on. Some runaway ads, this is an actual ad. Um, um, so to see how folks are described like by their color, yellowish Negro fellow named Cyrus, formerly belonged to Williamson at Stono and was well known in town. And, Right, so that you would be advertised if you did run away. But what does this show you? It shows you resistance. Because right, folks are running away, so much so that they have to put ads in the newspaper to try to get, quote unquote, their property back. But it shows you that people are continuing to resist throughout this process. Massachusetts, right, we think of New England and the North as being uh, the home of freedom, but Massachusetts, as they said in the video, is one of the first colonies to legally establish slavery. So there was slavery north and south early on. It's not until much later that the north would abolish or begin to abolish slavery. That's not until after the American Revolution, which we'll get into um, next week sometime. 
So the first colony illegal, legally sanctioned slavery laws not eth racially or ethnically specific at first. Right. In the Puritan social structure, slaves incorporated into the families they serve. So they don't have these massive plantations. You might just stay in the back of the house right, um, and do different types of work. Virginia slave codes, we talked about some of the rules and laws around slavery. The same idea is in place that you want to control this population, especially as the enslaved population is growing in a place like Virginia. Uh, more and more people are thinking about controlling these folks. Part of this transition from indentured servitude, especially of white indentured servants, to racial slavery of Africans happens around 1676 with Bacon's Rebellion. Now, Bacon's Rebellion is an important tipping point this major revolt in Jamestown where folks, you know, indentured servants following Bacon, this guy Nathaniel Bacon, they literally rise up against the government and have a mini revolution. They burn down Jamestown. Right? At that point, a lot of folks are saying, you know what, we can't have these white indentured servants here anymore. They're too dangerous. We need to switch completely to another form of labor. They don't decide to give up tobacco. So who's going to work it? It's going to be slaves. This is one of these major tipping points because uh, these this, you know, blacks and whites getting together is seen as so, so dangerous. Um, you see a number of laws to, to you know, put that into place. Right, a free blacks is limited, so even if you're free, you're not completely free if you're African. Uh, these Africans are seen as racially inferior, less intelligent, right, less able to take care of themselves, quote unquote. Uh, this graph shows the population growth Purple is uh, white population, so you see how fast the white population is growing in thousands as opposed to the black population. So um, folks are always outnumbered. Africans are essentially always outnumbered, but they are growing. Right? In 1790, that's almost 20,000 Africans um, in the British colonies, but they're always outnumbered. New York. New York is a particularly significant colony, and that gets discussed more in the video a little later on. There are going to be some important revolts that happen in New York, in fact, um, as you mentioned here. Um, in 1712, there's some mysterious fires that started New York, and uh, <laughs> white indentured servants and African slaves are going to be blamed for these fires. And again, another reason to sort of transition away from white indentured servants and to try to use Africans only. Um, Mary Burton was a white woman that worked in a, a tavern. Uh, in this tavern, black and whites used to hit, kick it, basically. Black and white servants would hang out on the weekend and drink and do what they do. And Mary Burton worked there. And so after these mysterious fires, um, she's going to be one of the people that testifies and actually gets some, a bunch of folks executed um, around these revolts. Um, so again, part of breaking up that imagined community of servants is seen as particularly important. New England. New England's laws start to take away liberties previously enjoyed. Things are starting to change, even in the course of their, uh, their life. Right? So Anthony Johnson, that was mentioned early on, he's able to go from being an indentured servant, he gets his freedom, he buys a whole bunch of land, he has people working for him, including white indentured servants right, by the 1750s. But then things start to change. During the course of his life, he becomes this, la this large landowner, but eventually, it's going to be harder and harder for him and Mary Johnson to hold on to their land. It's eventually taken away, and they kind of die and disappear from the record. Uh, he, has, he has these kids and things, and they lose all their land, essentially, and are going to disappear from the record because it's becoming more and more difficult for Africans to hold on to their freedom. There are always going to be people that are free, but it be, it's becoming more and more difficult um, in Virginia and in other places, as you see here in New England as well. And New England laws took away liberties previously enjoyed by blacks. They still had more, more rights than uh, in other parts of the colonies. Uh, they could testify in court. Uh, they could sue. They could petition for their freedom. They're allowed to marry, but only with master's consent. If you live uh, apart, then you have to stay apart. Uh, but there are some, um, you see this loss of freedom that's beginning to happen. The, Kel the colony of the Carolinas comes in in this period. We talk about how the Carolinas, North and South, are going to be a little different than Virginia and in some of the other places as well. We can talk a little bit more about that um, next time. John Locke, the philosopher of freedom, was one of the people that writes the codes for Carolina. 
Uh, it's interesting, you know, John Locke is the one that um, all the founding fathers would read. So Thomas Jefferson, when he's writing things like all men are created equal, he gets a lot of that from John Locke. But in this case, look at how John Locke is thinking of this notion of being independent and free. For him, you are free to own slaves. And in terms of what he writes for North Carolina, every free man of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves, of what opinion or religion soever. So it's interesting in this notion of freedom. Right? For some, freedom is gonna mean the freedom to own other people. It seems like a contradiction, but this is how folks are reading. The growth of the black population would lead to laws to control their activities. The more Africans you get, uh, the more harsh laws you would see put in place. In fact, a whole court system is developed to deal just with enslaved peoples. Uh, the idea that you needed a separate kind of legal system for them uh, coincides with this idea that you're not seeing them as equal to you, you're not seeing them as people, that they need their own kind of rule book in a way. The French, the French had their own system of laws, the code uh, noir as they called it, black code basically. Uh, before 1724 there are no really hard and fast rules in the French, in, in French Louisiana. These slave codes would emerge after many, many Africans are brought to uh, what becomes Louisiana. And this is the, the code noir that the French would try to impose. Again, in some ways, the fact that they have different rules may make, different, make, make slavery look very different in French colonies than it looks in British colonies, than it looks in the Dutch, and it looks in the Spanish colonies. Right, so these are some of the things under the code noir. Sought to reduce manumission, which is the, the ability to get free, right, to get your freedom and to curb interracial mix, mixing. Uh, that was seen as dangerous, just as it was seen as dangerous in these British colonies. Slaves are denied property rights and there's severe punishment for runaways. It required masters to provide religious instruction. Right, so the idea that you're, you know, you're converting uh, folks, uh, and that's you know, one of the justifications used for slavery, you kind of see that written into the law. Masters are supposed to have certain responsibilities. They're supposed to provide religious instruction. They're supposed to provide adequate food and clothing. Now, of course, that doesn't always happen. I've seen some plantation. Uh, I've been to visit some in Louisiana, in fact, in, in New Orleans, and you sort of see um, the conditions. Many of them were not you know, providing adequate food and clothing and doing these things. But that's what technically they were supposed to do. Outlaw the separation of husbands and wives and the taking of children under 14 from parents. That's what it was supposed to do. They still are going to separate families, and you know children might be sold away as well. But you're not supposed to be allowed to do that in um, these, these colonies. Again, the law is often broken or ignored, but at least it was there. Some people say maybe this kind of mediates the harshness uh, a bit. Eventually, uh, Louisiana is transferred to Spain, and they might have more access to freedom because of that. And as we know, eventually it becomes uh, part of the British colonies, and so. It's going to change. Uh, the experience of slavery in, in Louisiana is going to change um, tremendously, uh, depending on who is in control, uh, depending on who is in control of the colony. OK, so that was a bit of um, you know, some new information, but mostly kind of review. I wanted to sort of put all this in, in context for you and have you think about it, particularly now that you have um, a study guide with 